thing when I printed it off, I went, oh man, I don't have any blanks on there. It's like, oh, bummer. Not that the blanks are all that difficult to fill in anyway. You guys pretty much fill them in, I think, before we even get there. But there's a lot of other stuff that you can be writing down on there. So sorry for the lack of blanks, all the guessing. Um, welcome to you all. I, uh, I recognize tons of you, and then there are some of you that I vaguely recognize as far as like you've been here once or twice every year for the last several years, and some of you are brand new first-time visitors, but welcome to you all. It's great to have you here joining us on this Labor Day weekend. I assume some of you are here on vacation and giving a little bit of that weekend uh, to the worship of God, and we're grateful you're here with us. Also welcome to those of you who are joining us online and perhaps outside we are very thankful for you. I see a lot of people checking in today. Great to have you all joining us. And uh, so we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. And so you can begin to turn there in your Bibles. And let's take a moment and ask God to teach us here. Let's pray. Lord, as we open up your word we want to, yet again, stop right at this moment and ask, uh, and just desperately plead with you, God, that you would teach us. Uh, you speak to us through James, and you say in the context of uh, hearing your word that we must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, Lord, we want to hear these things, and, and we want to, even if some of it were to prick us in our heart for some reason, we pray that you would help us to just humbly receive your word and that it would be implanted into our souls, uh, knowing that the message of your word and through faith in Jesus, you are able to save our souls. So we just come to you, God, and, uh, and ask for your leading in this time, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Today we have right here something that not all of history have been so blessed to experience. We have a very public assembly of Christians where we are able to sing out loud, we are able to open up and declare and publicly read and teach the Bible, we are able to talk about Jesus with one another, we are able to pray, we are able to not only do this in here very openly and publicly, but we can have it piped through some speakers and a screen outside to those walking by. Yes, we see you there on across the street looking through the window. We see you. To those of you who are joining us online, and we can do this freely. You know, there have been seasons and regions through the world throughout this age of the church where this activity is either illegal and punishable by law or socially unacceptable and the target of community violence. And I don't mean, uh, I don't by any means wish for this, but I wonder what it would look like, what this ministry would look like if Christianity suddenly became illegal or became so distasteful to the people around us that we became the target of violence day by day. Um, I haven't thought through all of what we would do in light of this. Uh, I don't know that it's, it's coming that quickly, but I would imagine we'd have to restructure at least a little bit. You know, we might decide to um, meet at a different location than such a public, prominent location. We might have to take our services into meeting in the middle of the night, you know, when everybody else is asleep. We might have to whisper sing, you know, not, not any of those where you have to really belt it out to hit the high notes. We would, we would whisper sing together. We might have to walk to church so as to not draw attention by having a bunch of cars around uh, where we're meeting. Uh, there's some things we might have to adjust. Uh, perhaps our numbers would decrease. You'd hate to think that, but maybe so. Because, you know, as we try to make church as convenient as possible for everybody, but, you know, meeting in the middle of the night and being quiet and you might get beat up or imprisoned for it, that's less than convenient. So maybe it would purify the congregation. Uh, maybe some of our seasonal or our uh, tourist traffic would die down. You know, people risk their lives 
all the time coming to Summit County to play in the winter on the slopes. You know, you're taking your life into your hands when you do that, or in the summer when you're skiing, uh, or not skiing, uh, biking, hiking, you risk your life. But going to church, if that's added to risking your life, maybe it would change attending church on vacation. I don't know. Well, again, I don't wish for it. I don't pray for it. I'm not forecasting it. Don't worry, I'm not trying to forecast it. But we never know. One day we may find out what that would be like. My assessment, and maybe it's incorrect, but I would say right now in these specific parts here that we are tolerated. I would describe it like that. Uh, That uh, we're not celebrated for sure. Uh, We're not necessarily well respected by everyone, but I would say that we're tolerated. Probably there would be some who would be very sad in our community to see us gone, but I'm sure others would celebrate. And not because we're mean people. I mean, I know you guys, a lot of you guys, and you're some of the nicest, kindest, most generous people. So it's not because of that, but it's because of what you stand for, the truths you stand for. It's because who you stand up for, Jesus Christ. And in the midst of a world where, says, where things like, where the people say in this world that the things that you're teaching and the things that you stand for in the Bible, those are actually evil and hateful things. Well, last week we studied the letter that Jesus dictated through John to the church in Ephesus. They were able to meet publicly without interference and do outwardly all the things that a church should do. Jesus even said, I see your deeds. I see all this stuff that you're doing. Uh, They were able to do all of these wonderful things, seeming to have it all, but Jesus saw through the outside. He saw into their heart. He saw their motivation, and he points out that they were doing what they were doing without love. And as great as that church was on the outside, Jesus was about ready to go and remove their light from Ephesus if they didn't repent. Interesting thought that they had everything but the most important thing, which is love. Today we see quite a contrast with the church in Smyrna. And uh, they didn't have all the things that the church in Ephesus had on the outside. But Jesus, I mean, there was more concern for the church in Ephesus being snuffed out because of Jesus actually pulling their lampstand than the church facing persecution being snuffed out by persecution. They would remain. You know, you have less than 40 miles north of Ephesus was another big city, populous city, with a little church. This church was facing much different circumstances. Anything that they did outwardly caught attention and resulted in persecution. They weren't far away physically from the other church, but the climate of the city toward the church was different. The struggles of this church were different, and Jesus' message to the church was different. So with your Bibles open there to Revelation 2, let's see what uh, Jesus says to this church, again, dictated through John. And as we're reading through here, take special note of a few things. Notice how Jesus identifies himself to them. Notice the evaluation that he gives and then also notice in his appeal there at the end that this is for anyone who has ears to hear and so if you hear what's being read here or if you read it and you hear the message as you read it in your mind just know that this is also for you let's see what Jesus has to say starting in verses 8 through 11 And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Simply put, this is a letter to a church that is suffering deeply on the outside, physically poor on the outside, but is spiritually rich on the inside. And this letter, it does have a lot of the same components. You know, we said last week uh, that Jesus follows a similar template, a similar outline in all of these letters. It still has the similar flow, but there are certain things missing in this one than uh, we have in some of the others, namely the negative evaluation. It's only positive things Jesus has to say for this church, and we'll take a look at that here in a moment. But let's just jump in to see this message from Jesus to this church. As always, Jesus begins by revealing the audience. He says that this is to the angel of the church in Smyrna. So this was to be given to the messenger of the church in Smyrna to then take to the church and make sure that message, Jesus' message, gets to them. The name Smyrna, it is the Greek word for the Hebrew word for myrrh, the uh, aromatic resin uh, that used in perfumes and in burial spices. Uh, this myrrh, the result, the resin that comes from taking the specific plant and crushing it. And as you crush it, the resin that comes forth is a beautiful aromatic smell. And uh, it's a beautiful picture, actually, symbolic of what this church is facing. They're facing the crushing of suffering and persecution. But as they do that, they are such an, uh, a beautiful aroma to Jesus Christ. Myrrh, if you remember, was one of the three gifts presented at Jesus' birth, which was a prophetic foreshadow of his sacrificial death on the cross for our sins. So that's the name, uh, uh, what this name means of Smyrna, it means myrrh. But Smyrna, like Ephesus, was another very important city of the day. In fact, they say that it was the most beautiful large city of the day. It was about 35 miles north of Ephesus, also located on the coast of the Aegean Sea, a seaport city with a, a really good harbor. Uh, we talked a little bit about Ephesus uh, down south being a strategic city because of its harbor, but that, the, the river and the harbor where it met, the harbor ended up being silted in, and uh, that was one of the things that led to the demise of the city of Ephesus. But Smyrna, had a good harbor, and uh, it still remains today. In fact, the city of Smyrna is modern-day Izmir in Turkey, uh, which is the uh, equivalent, Izmir is the equivalent in the language of Smyrna. And so it's still a, a beautiful and a very busy and a large city. But Smyrna, ancient Smyrna, Smyrna was an idolatrous city, like so many of them. They had temples to the gods and goddesses of mythology, Specifically, temples to Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, Asclepios. One of their favorites was the, the rowdy worship of the goddess Sibylle. And uh, she, they looked at her as a mother goddess and really took a liking to her. Smyrna was a, they were fanatical when it came to Rome. So much so that they actually had a temple dedicated to the worship of Rome. Seems kind of strange that they would go so far as to worship Rome, but they did. And, of course, they also were a major center of the imperial cult, uh, the worship of the Roman Caesar. They had a temple there, one of a few temples that was allowed to be built to, dedicated to the worship of Caesar himself. And in Smyrna, just like a lot of the Roman Empire, it didn't technically matter which god or goddess you wanted to worship as long as you also worshiped Caesar and you gave him first place. You know, they, they were always worshiping all sorts of gods. It's like, look, it doesn't really matter as long as you give Caesar his first place. And the ritual for worshiping Caesar, from what we understand, wasn't even that complicated and expensive. You just needed to give a pinch of incense in an altar dedicated to Caesar, and you needed to declare that Caesar is Lord. And if you did that, you got this little paper, this little certificate saying that you had done your religious duty for the year, 
and then life could go on quite nicely for you. You could engage in all that uh, the city had to offer. This act of, of Caesar worship seemed to be more of a political statement than, than anything else, showing your allegiance to the emperor and to his empire. That being the case, technically a person could be a Christian without too much physical or social trouble as long as they just offered that simple little sacrifice of worship to Caesar and declared him as Lord. But I think you could probably see the problem with that. <laughs> that that wasn't actually sitting well with the Christians because we are not to worship any other God but the one true living God. And though technically Caesar was a quote-unquote little L Lord on earth among men, I mean he was the, the emperor, the, the issue is that by making this statement, it implied that he was the Lord above all and that he was even Lord over Jesus Christ. And so a lot of Christians were not willing to sin in that regard and, uh, and worship Caesar in order to preserve their way of life. As a result, they suffered. Really, one of the best things that the ancient city of Smyrna had going for it, the best thing they had going for it, according to what Jesus says here, and according to what we see in chapter one, is that they had a lampstand. Remember, symbolic of the church. There was a church, a genuine church, in ancient Smyrna. Shining the light of Jesus Christ into the midst of that spiritually dark area. But the people of Smyrna didn't like them. They didn't even tolerate them like the other cities of the day could tolerate Christians. They weren't tolerating them in Smyrna. And this, we'll see, led to persecution, which is a big theme in this letter that Jesus sends to them. So now that we know a little bit about Smyrna, the church in Smyrna, what they're up against, let's go on to see the author, the rest of verse 8. And the author, of course, is Jesus Christ. He's the author of all of these. But he identifies himself using two descriptive statements from chapter 1. The end of verse 17, beginning of verse 18 is where we find these uh, initially made. But this is Jesus describing himself to them in a very meaningful, relevant way. What does he say? First of all, he calls himself the first and the last. He describes himself this way for a couple of reasons. This statement, first of all, know that it was made by and ascribed to Yahweh, Jehovah God, in the Old Testament. Isaiah 41.4, 44.6, and uh, 48.12, among other places, we have God in the Old Testament saying, I am the first and the last. So this describes God in his eternal existence. The fact that he is the first, the source of all things. He is the last. He is the goal for all creation. This is a statement made by God in the Old Testament. Well, here Jesus making this of himself is revealing his own unity and identity with the Father. He is identifying himself as God and unified with the Father. He's identifying himself as the eternal one, that just like the Father, he is the source and he is the goal of all creation. What a massive claim Jesus makes in this statement, that he is the same as the one in the Old Testament making this de declaration. But what he goes on to say next is a bit paradoxical. Notice the other identifying statement. He is the one who was dead and has come to life. How can the eternal one, the first and the last, the source and the goal of all creation have died? Well, this brings up that one of a kind union that was Jesus Christ. He was and is 100% God. And at his entrance, in, entrance into humanity, at the incarnation, he also became 100% man. Without setting aside his deity, without diminishing his deity at all. And Jesus Christ is the unique one. One person, yes, but two natures being God, man. As a man, Jesus could surrender himself to physical death. His physical body, he could subject to physical death, which he did. In order to die for our sins, 
He died at, as an innocent substitutionary sacrifice for us, for sinful humanity. And being the infinite God, his death had infinite effect. His death had infinite applicability, infinite power to all who would receive him. Being a man, he was a legitimate substitution for mankind. It wasn't something other than man, because he was 100% man as well. And so this was a sacrifice that could be accepted by God on our behalf. So Jesus here is identifying himself as the one who died for the sins of the world but came back to life never to die again. And so of all the description of Jesus in chapter 1, you might say, why did he use these two as he's preparing to address Smyrna? These are extremely important in the context of how he's going to go on and evaluate their current circumstances and then what he's going to tell them they need to do. For what they are facing, Jesus could legitimately say, I have also faced this. You guys are suffering tribulation and poverty and persecution even under the point of death. So have I. So I can identify with you and I have the right to say what I'm going to say to you. So after these two meaningful descriptions of himself as the author here, he moves forward into his evaluation in verse 9. Third in your notes, the evaluation. A side thought here. Have you ever had anybody in life evaluate you? And let's say it's at your job, or let's say it's with one of your hobbies, or something that you're doing. And not that being evaluated is a problem, but let's say that the person that's evaluating you has never done what you're doing. Never done, never experienced what you're doing, and they're the ones evaluating you. Uh, I've had that happen in different settings, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to take much evaluation from a person like that. You want to be humble, and you want to try to receive it. But in my mind, I find myself thinking, it'd be a lot easier coming from you. I'd trust your evaluation more if I knew that you at some point had been in my shoes, that you tried this, that you've done it, and you've succeeded, and therefore are evaluating me. You know, you're speaking to me about things uh, which you've never experienced before. I don't know if you've ever had that. You probably have. You probably can identify. Well, in this letter, Jesus is speaking to Smyrna, as with the rest of these letters, Jesus starts by saying, I know, in this evaluation. He says, I know. He said last week, I know your deeds. He says this week, I know your tribulation. He'll say, I know where you live. Well, when someone says that, that sounds a little more threatening. I know where you live, but he's more empathetic in what he's saying in that one later. But in this case, he's saying, I know. It's important for us to remember about Jesus, that with him, it's not about this guy who sits up in this lofty, heavenly office, and he just squints as he's trying to see what's going down on earth, and you know, from my vantage point, you know, the earth is, I don't see what's going on over here on the other side, you know, down under in Austria, I can't see down there, what's going, I don't even know what's going on down there, okay, here he comes, I see him coming around now, and I'm trying to figure out what, what are they doing, and he's hearing reports maybe through people's prayers if they're loud enough to reach his ears. And maybe he's hearing reports from the angels telling him about stuff. And so, so from this lofty, powerful office up in heaven, he's making his decisions and he's issuing his commands. You need to realize that's not how it is with Jesus. He's not evaluating things that he has no experience with. What we know, to the contrary, Jesus entered into humanity. He became a man. He's walked the same paths, faced the same difficulties, and knows firsthand what this life's all about. We call him, theologically, we call him our sympathetic high priest. That comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. You can write it there if you want. The author says of Jesus, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Double negative. It means we have a sympathetic high priest there. He goes on to say, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. 
Simply put, Jesus legitimately understands what we're going through, what they're going through. And in identifying himself in this way with those two descriptions, he goes on to make this evaluation. And with Smyrna, and there's only one other church, the church in Philadelphia, there's only positive evaluation, nothing negative. Now, you'll look through and you say, well, those sound pretty negative. Well, their physical situation, their physical circumstances were difficult. But Jesus is going to give them insight into their spiritual quality, and it's very positive. Let's see what Jesus says. First, he says, I know your tribulation. And once again, we just got to clarify this. This is not to be confused with the eschatological great tribulation that the book of Hebrew or the book of Revelation goes on to talk about in chapters 6 through 19. This is not a discussion on the great tribulation where a Christ-rejecting world is facing the wrath of the Lamb or facing the wrath of Christ. This is descriptive of the everyday tribulation and suffering that all of us are guaranteed to face for two reasons. It's the natural byproduct of living in a fallen, sin-corrupted world. We will face seasons of difficulty and tribulation, but we will also face it because we live for Jesus Christ in a godless, Christ-rejecting world. Now, this little discussion on this is not a reference to the tribulation, some might try to argue otherwise and say, oh, you, you pre-tribulational rapturists, just like you, Pastor Mike, you are, you're simply an escapist. You know, you, you, fear, you fear what you would see in Revelation about the tribulation, and you would try to you know, just for your own sake of your own mental health, you would try to develop some kind of theological framework so that you could escape uh, and biblically try to justify why you would escape that. And realistically, that's a, a very wrong assessment of the position. Um, it's a, due to a method of interpretation, a consistent method of interpretation, cover to cover, keeping Israel and the church distinct. And it says that we will be rescued from that tribulation. But... It's also a terrible thing when people, let's say like myself as a pre-tribulational rapturist, would go on to say that though, I don't, though we believe because of what the Bible says we won't face the tribulation, capital T, that we won't face tribulation at all. That's actually incorrect. For we will face tribulation in this life. We will face trials and tribulations. In fact, it's one of the promises of God for you and me today. Not the typical promise of God we love to cling to, but it is one. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Again, not the kind of promise we love to cling to, but we need to cling to these things. Understanding that if we're going to live for Jesus Christ outwardly, we will end up facing tribulation, persecution, suffering for our faith. And that helps us not to be surprised or discouraged when it comes because we say, well, God told us it would. It's a promise. Paul says in Romans 8, 18, that the momentary afflictions of this world are light in comparison to the glory that is to come. The magnitude of the bad we face in this life, bad getting as bad as it could possibly get in this life, doesn't measure up to the magnitude of the goodness that we will experience in eternal life in heaven. And so Jesus says to them, I know your tribulation. Jesus has suffered. He's been there. But he also points out, secondly, he says, I know your poverty. This part of their extreme suffering related to this poverty that they were enduring. There are a couple of words in the original Greek to describe poverty. One of them is just saying you don't have anything more than your basic, basic needs. And that's not this word. This word describes being utterly destitute. You have nothing to the point where all you can do is beg. You might say, well, what has caused this church to be so physically poor? Jesus will go on to reveal that it's connected in part to this persecution, being a Christian. But more specifically, being a Christian and not worshiping 
Caesar. Again, if you were willing to compromise and just go ahead and offer a little pinch of incense on the altar and declare, Jesus, uh, declare that Caesar is, is Lord, you know, you could skip all of this poverty and persecution. But if you resisted worshiping Caesar, you'd be blacklisted. If you had a business, people would avoid your shop. They wouldn't buy your product. They wouldn't hire you to work. They wouldn't sell, your, uh, they, they wouldn't sell you their goods. They might even break into and vandalize what you have or steal what you have. And again, it wasn't so much that they were worshiping Jesus, it's that they were celebrating him without compromise and refusing to worship their gods, namely Caesar. So in their physical, social, economic situation, they are severely poor. Uh, but Jesus gave the, them some insight about how he views them. You might feel beaten down. You might feel poverty stricken, but Jesus says, but you are rich. How encouraging that would be. As far as Jesus is concerned, they were as wealthy as it gets in what matters. They didn't have anything that the world would consider valuable, but they had what Jesus says is valuable. They, they were full of faith and they were faithful to him. How encouraging it would be in the midst of feeling the physical pressures of suffering, the poverty, and even letting those thoughts creep into your minds, like why is God withholding physical blessing from me? Am I doing something wrong? Am I not enough of a person of faith? And you're going through all these thoughts, just beating yourself down. And Jesus shows up and says, you know what? I see your physical circumstances here, but you are rich. Man, your tummy might still be hungry and growling at that moment, but your heart and soul would be filled to overflowing. Jesus says that they are rich. He also goes on to point out the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. One thing we must not forget is though Rome did persecute the church quite a bit, it, it, in the, the original persecutors of the church and agitators that provoked Rome were the religious Jews. The religious Jews viewed Christianity as a, as a uh, heretical uh, sect and they wanted to eliminate it to preserve purity. They viewed Jesus as an imposter, not the real Messiah, and everybody who follows Jesus as a defector from the truth. And so in Smyrna, there were a group of religious Jews that claimed to know God and follow God. And lucky for them, uh, probably because every time something went wrong, they would riot, but they were exempt from this Caesar worship. They didn't have to offer that little pinch of incense. They didn't have to declare Caesar as Lord. And so they were able to exist with relative peace and do whatever they wanted but they hated Christianity they hated Jesus and his followers and so they were major instigators of this persecution against the church in Smyrna Jesus revealed that these Jews though they claim to know God and fight for God's cause by persecuting the followers of Jesus they were actually followers of Satan Jesus called them a synagogue of Satan they thought that they were assembling in honor of God. They thought that they were doing God's work by trying to persecute the church. But God says, no, they're doing the work of Satan. In fact, the things that they say about God and the, fact, uh, the things that they say about God's people are blasphemous, Jesus says. Throughout this church age, there have always been people who try to claim to be Jews or God's chosen people and the recipients of all of God's bless blessings that were meant for, for the Jews, but according to God, they're not. And as their, all of their claims and the pushback that they give against God's actual chosen people, God calls blasphemous. Uh, but in Smyrna, these so-called Jews were a big part of the reason behind the physical tribulation and poverty that these Christians were facing. 
Their physical situation was not positive, but Jesus' evaluation of them was. They were rich, he says. Now, there's no other evaluation he gives of them. There's nothing negative to be said. And so with nothing negative to evaluate, he just moves on next to give them the remedy. Verse 10, the remedy of their situation. Now, remedy implies maybe they're doing something wrong, but again, there's nothing wrong except they have difficult physical circumstances. And so this statement here, this instruction is for them to hang on to in the midst of their difficulty. I like to try to put myself in their shoes. You know, I don't know when they're gathered here, but knowing persecution, you can imagine maybe it's the middle of the night. Uh, maybe it's lights very dim and wherever they're meeting and they, the messenger comes back having visited John and received this book of Revelation. And now they're getting to the part that's to them. And they're like, all right, this is going to be great. And they've just received this incredible encouragement that though things are difficult for you, you are rich. Maybe they're thinking, all right, things are going to change. We, we, he's going to say, hang in there because suffering is almost over. Well, to the contrary, he says in so many words, hang in there because it's only going to get worse. He says to them, do not fear what you are about to suffer. There was more suffering ahead. And they were going to be tempted to fear, but Jesus encourages them, do not fear. What is it that they were about to suffer? Jesus goes on to say, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. So there was going to be an increase or a surge of persecution against them. And he reveals the source of this persecution that though it looks like it might be this synagogue of Satan, though it looks like it could be uh, manifest through the Roman Caesar, the Roman emperor, it's actually the devil himself. Satan is the one, ultimately, who is striving against Jesus and his people. The devil knows how to stir people up and get them to turn against the church and instigate persecution. And so Jesus reveals that the devil is behind it. He's behind this incoming surge of attack and persecution to the, to the extent that some of them are going to be yanked from their midst. They're not going to see him because they're going to be put in prison. All of that being said, though, Jesus indicates here that it's only under his permission that Satan is only allowed to do what he does still under God's permission, for Jesus says this will be a test, a test of their faith over fear and as we'll see it will be rewarded greatly if they remain faithful Jesus also says about this incoming increase in persecution that you will have tribulation for 10 days and honestly there's quite a bit of talk out there amongst um, theologians as to what this 10 days refers to is it literal that there's going to be this surge of a, a persecution that will last for 10 days where maybe they're going to sweep through and pull some out and imprison them. Uh, but it's, it's not going to be too long, so hang in there. And he doesn't say that some of you are going to die, but he's saying some of you are going to be put in prison. But don't be afraid. It could be that it's a literal statement there. It could be metaphoric, some would say, of, uh, of just a short period of time. I mean, it's not actually 10 days, but it's just representing for a little bit of time you're going to face increased persecution. Or perhaps it's symbolic and prophetic, representing 10 periods of persecution under 10 Roman rulers. And there's actually some pretty fascinating studies done that show historically 10 seasons of heightened persecution against the church. Um, so it could be that. I personally lean toward either it being literal that there was a 10-day surge coming against them that they needed to, to be faithful through, or that it's symbolic of 10 uh, periods of persecution in the early church but realistically and you can go and study it out and figure out where you want to land but realistically the message is the same there's going to be an increase in persecution don't be afraid if persecution comes your way do not fear it that's what he's telling him to do and he can do it 
from the empathy of saying, I've been there. He's not evaluating them having no idea what persecution's all about. No, he's been there. And so he is telling them how to keep pressing in their difficult physical situation. After this, in the end of verse 10, he gives them the consequence. Again, consequence implies something negative, but there's no negative evaluation. Therefore, this consequence is a positive consequence for them following through and being faithful. What does Jesus say to them? Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. This is one of five reward crowns revealed in Scripture. Uh, we know that there are at least five reward crowns. But this is one of those five. The word crown is the Greek word stephanos. It's not the word uh, translated diadem. That means like a kingly authoritative crown. This is the winner's crown, the victor's crown. In other words, you face some kind of battle or challenge and you overcame, you won, and so you get this reward. And so in this case, when persecution comes, if you remain faithful all the way through, even if it costs you your life, you receive this reward of the crown of life. I would probably be missing something important if I didn't give you at least one example in the early church, even specifically in the, in the church of Smyrna, of persecution relating to or resulting in the death of, of a believer. Um, you've probably heard the name Polycarp before. You're like, yes, my favorite name. I'm going to name my son that. Polly, for short, or Carp. A less attractive name, unless he looks like one and then it could be descriptive, but Polycarp. Polycarp. You heard that name? Well, you'll never forget it now. How does he relate to Smyrna? Polycarp had a mentor, someone who discipled him. You know who that was? John. John the Apostle. When he took on discipleship ministry, he took on this poor guy named Polycarp, and uh, he began to pour into this guy's life, and Polycarp became a hero of the faith in the early church. And uh, when John came back from the Isle of Patmos, and he moved, Paul moved, or John moved back to Ephesus, Polycarp was in Smyrna. And Polycarp actually was appointed by John to be the bishop or the elder of the church in Smyrna. And so, Polycarp, when he was a very old man, it was discovered that he hadn't been making the required offering to Caesar. And he was forced to do so or else be executed. If he would say, Caesar is Lord, he could spare his life. If not, he was going to be fed to the animals. And then as they began to review and they said, well, there's a technicality here. We can't actually feed them to the animals today because they're already put away. You can read the report. They're discussing on this. And they say, so if we're going to do it today, it's going to have to be by fire. And so they begin to threaten him with fire. Put a little pinch in the fire or else we're going to burn you with fire. And uh, the records show that when he was pressed to worship Caesar, Polycarp said these very famous lines. He said, 80 and six years I have served him, and he never did me any injury. How can I then blaspheme my king and my savior? It goes on to say that they continued to threaten him with fire in that same context. And he said to them, you threaten me with fire which burns for an hour and after a little while is extinguished. But you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Do what you will do. <laughs> and so they gathered up wood. Um, the record shows that it was Jews, the synagogue of Satan, that took the lead the religious Jews in getting the firewood, put, piling it all up. They put Polycarp on top. They didn't even have to bind him there because he said, I'm willing to die for Jesus. They set the wood pile ablaze and the record shows actually that the fire was not, was not burning Polycarp. And so someone ran over and actually stabbed him 
and uh, put him to death, and then the fire was able to consume his body. But Polycarp is one of many examples of people of faith, even specifically in Smyrna, who were faithful in the midst of persecution, faithful to the Lord Jesus, even unto death, and no doubt receive the crown of life as a reward. Jesus goes on in verse 11 to make the appeal. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is for the church in Smyrna, yes, but it's also for the churches, plural, for all churches in this age. But it's also for anyone who has an ear and hears this message. Therefore, it is for you and for me. The church in general in Smyrna faced persecution, Some were imprisoned, some were even put to death. And over the course of the next couple of centuries, there were many believers who were heavily persecuted, not just in Smyrna, but all over. Even today, around the world, there are Christians who are suffering due to persecution, suffering tribulation, poverty, imprisonment, even death for their faith. And so we pray for them. We pray, God, grant them grace and faithfulness no matter what they face. God, help them to be merciful, to be faithful, even unto death. And for us, in whatever level of suffering we may go on to face, may we not fear, but may we remain faithful. Finally, we see the promise. The promise to the overcomer. The overcomer, he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Again, according to 1 John 5, 4 and 5, John's identification of the overcomer is a reference to any genuine born-again believer, a person of faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you've been born again, this is a promise for you. And this is a promise that we will be protected from the second death. The second death is mentioned later in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, defined as eternal death in the lake of fire. That's the eternal destruction place for those who have not received Jesus but have rejected him. So believers, they're only subject to the first death. That's physical death. Unless the rapture happens in your your time, you are subject to the first death, physical death. But if you've been born twice, meaning physically born, so you're alive, if you've been born again, spiritually, you've come alive in Christ, then you're only subject to that first death, physical death. And... um, For those who have not been born again, uh, those who have been born one time, not a second time, they will face two deaths. There's the first physical death that all face, but there is this second death, which is eternal destruction in the lake of fire. But Jesus says, don't fear, because you're not going to face the second death. You know, today in our country, persecution is on the rise, somewhat rare, but it does happen that a person will go to prison or even die for their faith in Christ. It happens. Um, It may increase. I don't know. But either way, you and I are encouraged not to fear. We don't have to fear. We are to remain faithful. For the worst thing that could possibly happen to us in the midst of persecution is the first death. Which gives way to what? Heaven, glory, paradise, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's actually a win, according to the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter 1, Paul's in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to make it out or not or whether he's going to be put to death for his faith. He says, I don't even know which to choose if I had the choice. He says, for to me, to live is Christ, but to die is what? Gain. It's a win, 
according to Paul, Philippians 1, 21. To the overcomer, you don't have to worry, even in the midst of persecution or the face of physical death, because of this promise, you will not be hurt by the second death. That's the big one. That's the one that's reserved for all who reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. Today's Communion Sunday. I'll invite the music team back up and the guys to get everything finalized with the elements. Communion Sunday, where we take the time to reflect upon the sacrifice Jesus made to save us from the second death. Jesus came and lived a life without sin, but then, as we talked about earlier, being both God and also 100% man, he took our place. He died on the cross for our sins. He paid the price that our sins demanded be paid. He took the punishment for our sins upon himself. His body was punished with the punishment that was meant because of our sins. It was meant for us. And his innocent blood was shed for our forgiveness. When we take the uh, communion elements, we remember his body represented in the bread that was broken for us. Uh, we remember that as his body was being punished with the punishment meant for us, that his innocent blood was shed. We remember that when we take the cup with the juice. It represents his blood that was shed for our forgiveness and cleansing. Now, we don't require that you be a member of this church to uh, take communion with us, but all we ask is that you uh, be a member of the body of Christ, meaning that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin, that you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again the third day and that you have gone to him and accepted that payment and that you are trusting in him and in him alone for your forgiveness and your salvation. And if that's you, we, in, we invite you to take communion with us. Uh, if you have not asked Jesus to forgive you and save you, do it today. Like, do it now. It just as a matter of you moving your faith, your trust, off of whatever it has been upon hoping that you're going to make it into heaven and putting it all onto Jesus because of what he's done, making your payment, rising again, and you've received him and you trust in him. We're going to have a moment of quiet self-examination and reflection. And uh, for those of you who need to ask Jesus to forgive you and save you, do it then. Don't wait. Do it then. Uh, for some of us believers, uh, maybe there's some unconfessed sin in your life during this time of, of quiet reflection. You can talk to God about it. And for others of you who've been keeping short accounts and you're all confessed up and you're living for him, well, then take the time to give him thanks and praise for the sacrifice that he has made. Uh, we're going to do as we, we, we typically do after some time of self-examination. We'll dismiss you all starting in the front rows. If you're not gonna take communion with us at that point, you could um, just leave if you would like. If you're gonna take communion, we'll, we'll have people stand up starting in the front rows. You'll work your way out these side aisles and you'll come back in the center aisle and the, the trays of elements will be back there and you just take a stack of two cups. One will have the bread and one will have the juice. Come back to your seat and then we'll take communion together. But let's just take a moment here before our Lord in quiet self-reflection and then we'll continue on.